Urban sprawl. We've all seen it. The strip malls, residential subdivisions, clogged streets. But which U.S. metro area sprawls the most? Is it Los Angeles, a city built around the car? Or is it another Sunbelt city like Phoenix, Las Vegas, San Antonio, or Atlanta? Unfortunately, answering this simple question is actually really hard. Before you can say which city sprawls the most, first you have to define what sprawl is and how best to measure it. So let's start there at defining sprawl. The most tempting way to define sprawl is by describing it. You know, listing the things that make sprawl sprawl. Cul-de-sacs are often considered sprawl indicators because they create street patterns that favor cars over pedestrians. A strip mall, shopping malls, or any business that separates themselves from the street with a parking lot are considered sprawl too. How do the experts define sprawl? Urban historian Dolores Hayden acknowledges that sprawl is hard to define. It says that most definitions include language about low density, single purpose, residential or commercial construction, and locations distant from existing public services and infrastructure. Other scholars have called sprawl unsustainable, uncoordinated, inefficient, and auto-dependent. As there is no one definition of sprawl, researchers create their own definitions or rely on those created by others. I think the best definition is both clear and measurable. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to define sprawl as low density, meaning areas without tall buildings and lots of space between buildings, single purpose, meaning zoning separates commercial, residential, and industrial uses to an extreme degree, and auto-dependent, sprawling areas are terrible places to get around on bike or on foot. Okay, now that we have a workable definition, we can begin to measure cities and figure out which one sprawls the most. But how? We need to come up with several different metrics because our definition consists of several different dimensions. To measure the residential density of an area, the most common measure is simply persons per square mile or some other unit of area. You can calculate this metric for small areas of a city, such as census tracts or blocks, and get a map that shows the difference in density between the city center and the suburbs. You can also determine density by measuring the percentage of the population living in neighborhoods denser than, say, 12,500 persons per square mile. That's the density that's generally transit-supportive and urban feeling. Urban sprawl tends to have very separate land uses, so we need to measure the degree to which a city has a mix of uses or not. As with all of these dimensions, there are lots of ways to measure this. You can measure the percentage of residents that live with a business within blocks of their homes, or measure the percentage of residents with a shopping center within one mile of their homes. You could do the same sort of thing with schools or other institutions as well. The idea here is that the areas of urban sprawl will have lots of people that do not have good shopping options within walking distance of their homes. How do we measure how auto-dependent a city is? Again, there are several ways to do this, but researchers often measure the road network. It's generally believed that sprawling areas designed around the car have much larger blocks with fewer intersections. Dense, walkable areas have a finer-grained street network. Using publicly available street network data and geographic information system software, researchers can calculate the average block size and intersections per mile to get a sense for how much of a city has an auto-oriented street network. At this point, it should be obvious that it's pretty much impossible to identify one single city that sprawls the most in the United States. For one thing, researchers can't even agree on a definition for sprawl, and secondly, there are dozens of different metrics for measuring sprawl, and the ones chosen will have an impact on the overall results. That said, several studies have tried to measure sprawl and come up with cities that sprawl the most, and I'll share the results now. A 2003 study that considered residential density, land use mix, centrality, and street accessibility found that Atlanta, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, and Riverside San Bernardino scored on the sprawl end of all metrics. One study used an entirely different set of methods. It calculates the overall extent of a metropolitan area by analyzing the light from nighttime satellite photos. It then compares the new boundary with the population for an area to get an overall density. The author found that non-coastal metro areas like Minneapolis-St. Paul, Atlanta, Dallas-Fort Worth, St. Louis, and Kansas City have higher levels of sprawl than their coastal counterparts. A 2017 study of change in sprawl over time for the 51 largest metro areas found that Oklahoma City, Austin, and San Antonio are becoming less dense faster than any other metro areas. There are other studies, but this sampling shows the variety of metro areas named as having the most urban sprawl. Only one city was mentioned twice in this group of three studies. This is why it's really important to both understand the definition of sprawl and how sprawl is measured. Different methods will yield different results. This holds true for news articles you'll see pop up from time to time, like the most crime-ridden cities or the best places to retire. When reading, check to see how they define their topic and how they measured. Little changes to each can have big impacts on the results. 
Just a quick clarification. In this video, I use the terms city and metropolitan area interchangeably, but when researchers study sprawl, they almost always use the scale of the metropolitan area. So when I said city, I meant metro area. If you want to learn more about the difference between cities and metro areas, check out my video on the layers of government and consider subscribing.